Once it's determined that the patient has a hypoosmolar hyponatremia, the next step is to determine the patient's fluid status, from which we can then classify the hyponatremia into one of these three subtypes, as we've previously mentioned. A thorough history and clinical exam should also be undertaken, as this often reveals the cause of the hyponatremia. If the patient appears clinically dehydrated or hypovolemic, then the patient has hypovolemic hyponatremia, where there are true sodium losses and to a lesser extent, volume loss. The sodium losses can come from the kidney, which would be pathological, because in a hypovolemic state, the renin angiotensin aldosterone system should be activated, and therefore there would be more distal sodium reabsorption, and there should be less sodium in the urine. But when you have salt-wasting nephropathies, central nervous system disease, which mitigates this process and leads to salt-wasting, or you take diuretics or medications that inhibit the renin-angiotensin-aldosterone system and therefore compromise the ability to reabsorb sodium through the nephrons, all of these processes will lead to more sodium accumulating in the urine and therefore urine sodium of more than 20 millimoles per litre. In contrast, the patient can be hypovolemic and lose the sodium before it gets to the level of the kidney. Most commonly, this can be through the gastrointestinal tract, through significant nausea and vomiting, and significant diarrhea, which usually can be picked up from the history. Apart from gastrointestinal losses, you can also lose sodium through the skin, through things like severe burns, or even things like sweat, in the setting of cystic fibrosis. You can also get what is colloquially known as third spacing, where in inflammatory states such as severe pancreatitis, the combination of vasodilation, possibly leaky vessels, as well as hypoalbuminemia in the context of an acute phase response, leads to leakage of fluid from the intravascular space into the interstitial space, which sits between the intracellular space and the intravascular space. This leads to a reduced effective intravascular volume and therefore leads to activation of the renin-angiotensin-aldosterone system and subsequently leads to water retention, which therefore causes a hyponatremia. And with increased sodium reabsorption with an activated renin-angiotensin-aldosterone system, there's very little sodium in the urine and therefore the urine sodium is less than 20 millimoles per litre. And so when a patient has hypovolemic hyponatremia, you can do a urine sodium to be able to distinguish between renal losses and extra renal losses. Where in renal losses, there's some pathology causing the inability of the nephrons to reabsorb sodium and therefore there's relatively more urine in the sodium causing a urine sodium to be more than 20 millimoles per litre. Whereas in extra renal losses, the sodium is lost from sites before it reaches the level of the kidney and coupled with a activated renin-angiotensin-aldosterone system, there's increased sodium reabsorption and therefore relatively less sodium in the urine, and hence the urine sodium is less than 20 millimoles per litre. Now essentially the opposite to a hypovolemic hyponatremia is a hypervolemic hyponatremia, where the patient presents in a fluid overload state, which can be picked up from clinical examination. In this scenario, the fluid overload is due to a hyperactivated renin-angiotensin-aldosterone system in the setting of heart failure, liver failure, or significant kidney disease, particularly nephrotic syndrome because the low albumin leads to the third spacing or shifts of intravascular fluid into the interstitial space because of the reduced oncotic pressure and therefore the reduced effective volume in the intravascular space also leads to hyperactivation of the renin-angiotensin-aldosterone system. The renin-angiotensin-aldosterone system is also hyperactivated in the setting of heart failure because the reduced cardiac output leads to reduced renal perfusion which leads to the activation of the RAS system and also in liver failure where accumulation of intravascular volume in the splanchnic circulation leads to reduced volume in the rest of the systemic circulation and therefore there's reduced renal perfusion and hyperactivation of the RAS system. In all of these cases, 
the hyperactivated REST system leads to sodium reabsorption at the level of the nephrons, which therefore leads to reduced sodium in the urine, and therefore a urine sodium of less than 20 millimoles per liter. While this is a consistent finding in heart failure, liver failure, and nephrotic syndrome, it is less consistent in other causes of renal disease because there may be impaired ability of sodium reabsorption in the nephrons, which can therefore lead to a high urine sodium of more than 20. Urine sodium is therefore less useful in the setting of hypervolemic hyponatremia, where the underlying etiology is usually obvious from whether the patient has significant heart, liver, or kidney disease. And thirdly, and perhaps the most common cause of hypoosmolar hyponatremia, is euvolemic hyponatremia, where on exam the patient is not obviously overloaded or dehydrated. The two main ways to get euvolemic hyponatremia is to have relatively too much antidiuretic hormone action or to drink too much water in the setting of polydipsia. Perhaps the most common cause of having too much antidiuretic hormone is something known as the syndrome of inappropriate antidiuretic hormone or SIADH, where in lung pathologies, central nervous system pathologies, and in physiological stress such as in sepsis, an increased amount of ADH is produced, which ultimately leads to more free water retention and while the sodium level stays the same, the effect of this is a dilution of the sodium, which leads to a hyponatremia. Certain drugs, particularly anti-epileptic drugs and antidepressants, which act on the central nervous system, are associated with SIADH, and hence hyponatremia. And as previously mentioned, the other drugs that can cause hyponatremia are those of the diuretics, particularly the thiazide diuretics, and to a lesser extent, furosemide and other medications that affect the RAS system. Furosemide or loop diuretics are much less significant causes of hyponatremia compared to thiazide diuretics by virtue of its mechanism of action, which is explained in a previous video about diuretics, which I'll put a link to here. But briefly, loop diuretics work by blocking the NKCC channel, which leads to reduced sodium reabsorption at the loop of Henle. This therefore impairs the countercurrent mechanism and ability to concentrate sodium in the medulla, which therefore leads to a reduced ability to reabsorb water, which somewhat mitigates the dilutional effect of water retention, where water retention is due to RAS activation in the setting of volume depletion from diuretic use. The other cause of SIADH is a paraneoplastic syndrome where malignancies such as small cell lung cancer classically can produce ectopic SIADH, which can then cause hyponatremia. Hypothyroidism is classically associated with hyponatremia, although the precise mechanisms are not completely clear, and recent studies have put this into question. It is thought that possibly the feedback mechanism with TSH leads to increased ADH production and therefore hyponatremia. The other cause is glucocorticoid deficiency, which occurs by various mechanisms, including a loss of the normal suppression of ADH by cortisol. Similarly, in mineral corticoid deficiency, you can also get a hyponatremia because there's reduced distal sodium reabsorption mediated by the mineral corticoid aldosterone, and so there is more renal losses of sodium, which can present as a hypovolemic hyponatremia. In all of these circumstances, you'll find that the urine osmolality will be elevated more than 100 milliosmoles per kilogram. And in the case of SIDH, usually the urine osmolality is several hundred. The urine sodium is more than 20 in all of these conditions because there is no significant intravascular volume depletion and therefore the renin-angiotensin-aldosterone system is not particularly activated. And so there's no particular impetus to reabsorb sodium from the kidney, so the urine sodium will not be low. And at the same time, the increased ADH action leads to more free water reabsorption, which therefore 
concentrates the solutes in the urine, leading to a higher urine sodium concentration. The other major cause of euvolemic hyponatremia is that of polydipsia, which is not an uncommon cause from my experience. This can be due to underlying psychogenic conditions or from taking too much alcohol, which is known as beer potomania. In this condition, the patient typically drinks large volumes of alcohol in the absence of other significant oral intake. The large volume of fluid intake leads to an increase in the intravascular volume and subsequent suppression of ADH production and a suppression of the RAS system, which therefore leads to increased free water excretion in the urine and therefore a more dilute urine with a urine osmolality of less than 100. Because alcohol has very little solutes and in that sense is like free water, drinking large quantities of this without supplementing with solutes with oral intake may lead to reduced total body sodium and therefore reduced sodium excreted in the urine as well. Although the defining feature of this is a very low urine osmolality. To distinguish whether the mechanism for euvolemic hyponatremia is driven by ADH or polydipsia, which are essentially opposite mechanisms, you can use a urine osmolality, but these mechanisms can often be distinguished purely based on the history when specifically inquiring about the amount and type of fluid intake. So now that we've talked about these different subtypes of hypoosmolar hyponatremia and their mechanisms, we can go on to discuss the treatments which aim to essentially reverse the underlying pathology. In hypovolemic hyponatremia, because the problem is both sodium losses and volume loss, you can treat this by replacing both the volume and the sodium with normal saline or other isotonic crystalloid intravenous fluids containing sodium. This is able to replace the volume deficit, which can then bring the patient back to euvolemia and at the same time will replace the sodium deficit, which together will treat the hypovolemic hyponatremia. Of course, you have to treat the underlying cause of the renal or extra renal losses of sodium, such as treating an infection if that is the cause of the GI losses, or stopping the diuretics if that is the cause of the renal losses. Treatment should continue until resolution of the underlying cause which would usually be transient or relatively short disease duration. In euvolemic hyponatremia, because the problem is that there's too much volume from water retention and a relatively normal amount of sodium in the blood, it makes sense that the treatment is there for fluid restriction because this will lead to increased free water excretion and self-resolution of the euvolemic hyponatremia. Now fluid restriction has to be quite significant in order for this to be effective, ideally less than one liter per day, but really it has to be less than about 800 mils per day. If fluid restriction alone doesn't work, you can cautiously try and increase the amount of sodium to match the relatively increased volume by giving sodium chloride tablet, which may then treat the hyponatremia. One way you can tell whether fluid restriction alone is going to be effective is by calculating the urine to serum electrolyte ratio, which is the urine sodium plus urine potassium divided by the serum sodium plus serum potassium. If this ratio is low, less than 0.5, this would suggest that the kidneys are already excreting a lot of free water. And so fluid restriction would induce more free water excretion which means the hyponatremia will likely resolve with fluid restriction alone. In contrast, a urine to serum electrolyte ratio of more than one would suggest that there's relatively less free water being excreted and that the urine is hypertonic relative to the blood. In this situation, fluid restriction alone is unlikely to resolve the hyponatremia as the kidneys are not able to excrete a high amount of free water from the start. These are scenarios where doing a urine potassium on top of a urine sodium becomes useful because you can then calculate the urine to serum cation ratio. As part of the workup for euvolemic hyponatremia, you should investigate for all of these other causes as well. 
including a morning cortisol, particularly if there are signs of glucocorticoid deficiency, such as nonspecific symptoms or hypotension, and consider investigating for mineralocorticoid deficiency, particularly if there's the classic pattern of low sodium and high potassium with a renin and aldosterone level. You can do a TSH to look for hypothyroidism, and you can investigate for all the causes of SIADH through imaging, particularly of the brain and lungs as appropriate, and working up the patient for sepsis. A thorough drug history is also important, particularly medications that the patient has started recently, in particular thiazide diuretics and other diuretics and medications that affect the RAS system, anti-epileptics, and antipsychotic and antidepressant medications. If the patient is found to have a polydipsia-mediated uvolemic hyponatremia, then obviously fluid restriction would work for this as well. And management would include a workup for psychogenic conditions, as well as counseling for alcohol cessation and improving nutritional intake. For hypervolemic hyponatremia, because the problem is fluid overload, treatment is targeted at the underlying cause of the fluid overload, whether it be heart failure with the specific heart failure with reduced ejection fraction treatment as discussed in a previous video which I'll put a link to here, and treatment of chronic liver disease particularly with spironolactone, as well as the treatment of renal disease particularly nephrotic syndrome and the underlying cause and other causes of severe renal impairment which may even need dialysis to prevent fluid overload. So to treat this fluid overload apart from the specific treatments that we've mentioned, fluid restriction is also very important and this is usually around 1.2 liters per day. Additionally, salt restriction may be required to prevent over accumulation of sodium in the setting of chronic hyperactivation of the renin angiotensin aldosterone system in all of these diseases. Hypervolemic hyponatremia in the setting of heart, liver and chronic kidney disease is often a poor prognostic marker because it represents advanced disease and is a manifestation of chronic RAS hyperactivation. Therefore, because hyponatremia is usually an advanced presentation, it should be pretty obvious if the patient has heart failure, cirrhosis, or chronic kidney disease. But these can be appropriately investigated with targeted investigations, such as liver function tests and liver imaging, renal function tests and renal imaging, and echocardiogram. So that covers the treatment for the three subtypes of hypoosmolar hyponatremia, linking it to the underlying pathophysiology. Before we finish, I just want to make an important point that when you're treating hyponatremia, particularly if it is chronic hyponatremia, you want to ensure that you don't correct the sodium too quickly because this increases the risk of pontine osmotic demyelination syndrome. 